All right, so we will be talking about Generation 4 nuclear reactors today, which means, uh, which means we'll be talking about thorium. It's not the only Generation 4 nuclear reactor, but it's one of the four nuclear reactors. So let us begin. What I'm going to do first is, I guess, describe what makes a Generation 4 nuclear reactor. There's some, I guess there's a variety of definitions that people use, and so I will cover some of those. Uh, when tokamaks, we will do tokamaks at some point when I know a little bit more about them, but we haven't, you know, fusion is not on the table for commercial nuclear reactors for quite some time, at least into the future, so it's going to be a bit before we get all the way to fusion energy. All right, with generation four nuclear reactors, there are a few different things that people are talking about. I, in my naive and uninformed mind don't think that the current things that are being built would be counted as generation four nuclear reactors, but instead would be counted as generation three plus. So just a reminder of the generations, the first generation didn't really get a name, but they're the stuff that were developed in the forties and fifties, uh, really early stuff that had a lot of problems. Uh, then you had generation two nuclear reactors, and those are the ones that most reactors are today, are the generation two. Uh, these were designed in the 60s and 70s and built in the 70s and, and 80s. And then you go to Generation 3. There aren't that many Generation 3 reactors uh, that are built because uh, there was something that happened in some place um, that kind of slowed down reactor, like the development and uh, addition of new nuclear reactors. So once this happened, things slowed down a little bit, and that was right around the time that Generation 3 would have been coming into their own. So, But there are some Generation 3. Then there's a switch to Generation 3 Plus, which are basically the same thing, except that they have additional safety procedures and safety designs in them. So these are Generation 3 reactors are safer than Generation 2 reactors, which are we already know are the safest form of electricity that we generate on the planet. These reactors, some of the changes in design are that they are walk away safe. So when you have a generation two reactor, you tend to have to, you need safety systems that are turn on when the reactor fails. So the reactor turns off um, through some inadvertent thing and you have to turn on a number of safety systems that keep the reactor in a safe state until you can address whatever the complication was and then go back. Generation three reactors, the main idea is that they should be walk away safe where if the reactor fails, then it puts itself into a safe state and you can go in and correct those issues at your leisure. There are also other issues with generation three reactors in terms of like fuel efficiency and some changes in the design. Uh, but for the most part, these are still light water reactors. And so they're still using water as the moderator. Um, they're still thermal reactors and et cetera and so forth. Some of the generation three plus, uh, the way, at least I would classify them as three plus, but I'm not an expert in that classification in the taxonomy. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is generation four nuclear reactors. And these are the ones that you hear about, but you don't see because they're being studied and not built for commercial purposes. Uh, generation four, well, our Fukushima was generation two. Were gen two actually safer than gen three? Uh, I don't think so. I think gen two are, gen three is safer in general, most mainly because they were built later. And so, you know, Every, whenever there's some mistake, um, and they don't have to be like catastrophic mistakes, it's like, oh, you know, this almost happened, we don't want it to happen in the future, how could we engineer something to make it better? Um, those things always get folded into new reactor designs, even redesigns of existing stuff, you know, because they have, they're maintained. And so if you replace a part that could fail in some uh, circumstances with a new part, on the same reactor, but that new part doesn't fail in the same way, then that reactor that you already have is already safer. Okay, which generation would a ship or submarine or aircraft carrier be? Most likely those would be generation two. Um, the ones on in the Navy are a bit different because they're designed. So the early naval vessels would be ones where you actually remove the core from the ship. So you go in, you cut the ship open, you pull the core out, you put it in upstate or like Eastern uh, Washington, and then you put a new core in and then seal it back up and then send the ship back out. I believe that the current generation of nuclear uh, naval ships, at least with the submarines, I don't know about aircraft carriers, because aircraft carriers are easier to service because they don't have to be watertight on the top. But with the current generation of submarines, I believe, I heard this from someone who served in the nuclear navy, so I'm going to go with it, uh, that the current generation of submarines, the fuel core is in the ship 
and the lifetime of the fuel core is the same as the lifetime of the ship. So you basically put in a fuel core that will last for 50 years, and then when the fuel runs out, the ship is already ready to be decommissioned. So that's what I think the current um, situation is on nuclear reactors, but or on nuclear submarines. But aside from that, I can't really say much. Some of the things that are being built right now are like new scale. I think they're called new scale. Uh, these are small modular reactors. So small modular reactors are ones where instead of having, instead of building a gigantic one gigawatt nuclear reactor, you build a 100 megawatt reactor and then you module, they're modular so that you can put one there and then you put another one next to it and then you put another one next to it. And so you can build up to a gigawatt by adding small pieces together instead of having uh, one gigantic one gigawatt reactor. The advantage that you get from something like that is one, you're producing more objects. So before we get all the way to generation four, let me talk about these small modular reactors. So with these, instead of having a one gigawatt reactor, so you have this huge thing, you have to build the containment building, you have to put this you know, infrastructure around it, you have this one core that's in there, you have to basically turn the, t the terrain into a factory that you can build the reactor on. So the reactor is built in place. You go there, you dig the hole, and everything is built right there on the spot. As a consequence, every time you build one, it's slightly different because the local environment is a bit different. In the case of small modular reactors, then instead of having a one single gigawatt plant, you'll have 10. So 10 would look something like this, 100 megawatt reactors. And these, now that you've made 10 of them, you start to get the economy of scale when you're mass producing something. And so you could build these, or, or cert, at least certain components of them in a factory instead of having to assemble them on the spot. And that can cut down significantly on the cost of putting these small modular reactors together. So then what you do is you have some kind of infrastructure that they can plug into. So maybe you'll have some, I'm gonna make something up on the spot, but you could imagine having some kind of situation where you have a bunch of reactors in some kind of building like this and they're they attach to different wings that come out and so uh, this way for example if you need to refuel one of the reactors you just remove that one fuel core the rest of these things can stay can remain on powered on you take this one out you replace it and now it operates so you could say if these all last for five years then you'd replace two at a time and then once a year you just replace or every six months you replace one of the reactor cores if you had 10 of them. So the, that's some of the advantages of small modular reactors. You can mass produce some components of them. Uh, as a consequence of the fact that there are more of them, it means that there's a better supply chain in terms of when you have a part that you need to replace every one, once in a while. So uh, suppose that there's a valve that you need to replace. Uh, there will be a steadier supply stream of those parts. And so the cost of the, the maintenance cost will go down as well. These, so new scale, I think it's called new scale, or is it, let, let me look it up real quick. Uh, is it new scale? Yes, new scale power, small modular reactor nuclear technology. Now, some people claim that these should be, um, or that these are considered generation four nuclear reactors. However, these are also light water reactors. Uh, let's take a look at the, at least the Wikipedia article, and we'll trust that they are uh, up to date. Okay, so it's in Oregon. It's nine feet by 65 feet reactor vessels using conventional light water cooling methods. So that's the thing. This is the thing in my mind, in my own mind, that separates the Generation 4 from the Generation 3 nuclear reactors. The Generation 3 is kind of the end of the line. What's the best you can do with the light water technology? And these are light water cooling uh, light water reactors. So light water cooling means that this water that is circulating through the reactor core, either directly through the reactor core um, when you have a boiling water reactor or through this uh, heat, what's it called? The heat exchanger where you have the reactor here and then you, this is, those are, that's not a letter. So here's your reactor and then you send in a pipe, uh, pressurized water here. So this would be a pressurized water reactor. The point being that you have that it's cooled with light water, which is what runs through that pipe right there. Okay, uses natural, natural water circulation that can operate without powered pumps. So this would imply that it's at least a generation three plus, the fact that it can operate without powered pumps. So it, um, that would add to the safety protocol that you don't have to have active 
machinery working that you just let um, convection drive a lot of the stuff that's happening in there. Um, I believe that they're making one of these power plants in Wyoming. I know that where I grew up that they had discussed bringing a power plant like this uh, into the into things. Uh, one of the things that was a big challenge for nuclear energy in the most recent decades has been the fact that natural gas has gotten significantly cheaper. So if you were to go back to the 80s, natural gas was pretty expensive, and so coal-fired power plants were the main thing. And nuclear was really promising at that time, but when natural gas became cheaper because of fracking, other new extraction techniques to get natural gas, so it became a lot more plentiful because we found a cheap way to get natural gas out of the crust. As the natural gas became cheaper, then nuclear became less viable relative to natural gas. And so that's one of the challenges. This should, these kinds of things should help alleviate that because you're getting the economy of scale that can help reduce the cost of nuclear energy. If natural gas becomes expensive again, then, then these will become uh, increasingly viable. Let's see, in comparison, the Energy Information Administration in 2011 estimated the cost to be $4,700 per kilowatt uh, for conventional nuclear power, $4,600 for carbon sequestration coal, and $931 for gas-fired plant. Okay, so there you go, $931 for a gas-fired plant. So there's that. All right, so that is new scale. There are other, I think, um, is TerraPower? I wanna see a TerraPower. That might be something else. Okay, maybe it's the TerraPower one that they're building in Wyoming. And But this, I think, is again, a small modular reactor style of the generation three variety. Let us see what Wikipedia says about this one. In Bellevue, Washington, uh, developing class of nuclear fast reactors. Okay, so that's something here that is different. It's a fast reactor, which means that um, it's not using, it's using fast neutrons. It's not using water as the moderator to slow things down. So that's kind of cool. A small core of enriched fuel at the center of a much larger mass of non-fissile material. In this case, depleted uranium. Neutrons from the fission in the core breeds new fissile material. We talked about breeder reactors last time. Producing plutonium-239, over time enough fuel is bred in the surrounding area of the core that it begins to undergo fission as well, sending neutrons further into the mass and continuing the process while the original core burns out. That's kind of cool. Over a period of decades, the reaction moves from the core of the reactor to the outside. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, let me show you what, what that one's talking about. And so maybe this one, anyway, so someone somewhere along the line, someone will decide that this is classified one way or the other. It's kind of a nebulous classification. Anyways. So what they're talking about here is you start here, you have a depleted core in here. So this is your fissile material. And as the neutrons escape this area, it starts to breed the uranium-238 into plutonium-239. Okay, This is a kind of mediocre fuel, but you breed it into a really good fuel, um, odd number again. And so the region where you have the plutonium-239 being developed starts to expand outwards from that. And then eventually the core of the reactor will, will burn out. It will become, the fissile material will become too spread apart because too much of it has already broken down that you can no longer sustain the reaction. But the reaction works its way outwards uh, as the supply of neutrons gets absorbed in the surrounding uranium-238 and turned into plutonium-239, which has a higher cross-section by about a, as, as we saw, it has a higher cross-section by about a factor of 10 as this uh, stuff moves out. So that's pretty cool. Let's see, a prototype. Uh, now, one thing to consider when we're looking at these different kinds of reactors is there are two numbers to look at. One of them is, uh, it will look like this, T and w MWE, like this. So this is megawatt thermal and this is megawatt electric. So megawatt thermal, this is the total power that's coming from the core. So this is total. And then this is the useful. So this is how much energy comes out that can be used in electricity. Because there's always, with any thermodynamic process, there's always gonna be some waste heat. So the total energy is how much energy is coming out of the core. Some fraction of that energy will go into producing electricity. Some fraction of the energy will be wasted because there's always gonna be waste. Okay, so the megawatt electric, this is the stuff, I'm pretty sure that's megawatt electric. Uh, this is the stuff that actually makes it onto the grid. So when you look at a power plant, this is typically what's reported. A one gigawatt power plant, they're talking about one 
one gigawatt electric. And that will typically imply a three gigawatt thermal um, in the case of a nuclear reactor, because there it's how much total thermal energy is coming out of the reactor core. Uh, let's see. So this is a 600 megawatt electric. You probably multiply that by a factor of two, maybe three to get to the actual energy that's being produced in the fusion in the core itself. Okay. Anything else on here? Oh, it has a molten salt. The company is also investigating molten salt reactor design in Southern Company as an alternative technology. Sodium fast reactor. Sodium fast reactor natrium. So natrium because... Uh, NAT or NA sodium NAT natrium used to be the chemical name for sodium I think I guess to the Romans or something like that combines a molten sodium reactor with a one gigawatt molten salt energy storage system oh one gigawatt hour okay so a gigawatt hour means that you can basically replace the production of the power plant for one hour because a typical power plant will be about one gigawatt. Molten salt energy storage system. Sodium offers 800 and 785 Kelvin temperature range between its solid and gaseous states, and that's important. So you have a huge, almost a thousand Kelvin in temperature range where you can operate uh, different processes, in, including the generation of electricity, but not limited to. Uh, sodium is non-corrosive, which sounds a little weird when you think about the C, but that is sodium chloride instead of just sodium. Atrium is fueled by a high assay, low enriched uranium as its fuel. It's enriched to contain 5 to 20%, between 5 and 20%. So that's uh, low enriched uranium for reactors has typically been 3%. This is quite a bit higher than that. Certainly 20% is a lot higher than that, but that's still not weapons grade. You still can't make a bomb out of this. Okay, power output is constant, 345 megawatts E as heat. Uh, that's That actually makes it onto the grid. So that's kind of cool. June 2021, TerraPower and Pacificor. So Pacificor is the utility that dominates a lot of the Intermountain West area. Plans to build a joint natrium reactor. Four sites in Wyoming impacted by closure of fossil fuel plants are under consideration for the demonstration reactor. Gillette Kemmerer. Kemmerer is the location of the first JC Penny store and Rock Springs. So Gillette's way up in the corner, uh, the upper right corner of Wyoming. Kemmerer's the lower left corner of Wyoming. I don't know where Glen Rock is. Um, and Rock Springs is also kind of in the middle of the south, the middle of the state. So uh, one of the things you can do with these kinds of nuclear reactors is that because, um, because of the way they're built, you can just bring them to an existing site where there's an old power plant and uh, presumably even reuse some of the materials that are there. Like if there's a, already a turbine there um, that hasn't gone through its useful lifetime, but you're not using the coal to, to boil the water, you can reuse some of that infrastructure. Certainly um, a lot of the stuff that connects it to the outer grid can be used. And so you're not taking up any extra space. You're getting more concentrated power um, by locating them on the site of a pre-existing coal-fired power plant, which Anyway, so there you go, uh, which are in fairly large supply in Wyoming because, because Wyoming is basically a big piece of coal. If you look at coal deposits in the United States, coal reserves in the USA, you will see a map, and that map includes the fact that Wyoming is basically all coal. Okay, so uh, here's Wyoming, and you'll notice that it's all coal. Uh, these different kinds of coal deposits are basically, uh, it's how, I think it has to do with how long it remained under the pressure or temperature conditions. The most valuable type, I believe, is anthracite. It's the most energy dense. Uh, also has the least amount of other stuff that burns into it, like that produces a cleaner ash, I believe. Um, and then you have this bituminous coal and then lignite, which is, I guess, you know, basically just like using cigarette it's basically like burning cigarettes or something like that. It's apparently not very good for the environment, but we have a lot of it if it ever can, gets down to the point. But anyways, you can see in Wyoming and Utah, um, there's quite a bit of coal in that area, as there is also in Appalachia and in Illinois. So there's a lot of, a lot of coal in Illinois. So Wyoming has a lot of power plants that uh, use coal and now they are saying, well, we can maybe reuse these sites to install a nuclear power plant. All right, now, 
moving on from here, we went back to, we need to go back to whatever we were talking about, uh, which is, those are generation three nuclear reactors. So small modular reactors are not necessarily generation four nuclear reactors. But it, again, it depends on how you classify them. So what I wanna talk about is specifically the generation four designs. So, oops, I need to come here. Generation four. Okay, this, these are things that are currently being developed. They're not ready for prime time. Although we're getting to the point where we could imagine installing some prototypes and seeing, okay, we're gonna build a small plant that maybe 10 megawatts or maybe up to 100 megawatts. And then we will try to break it. We'll see how does it fail? What are the things that wear out the fastest? How can we change this? What parts corrode too quickly? And how, you know, what kinds of things, if it's part of the commercial operations, what are the kinds of stresses that these power plants are gonna be under? as opposed to the, the stresses they're under during your research um, as you're developing those reactors. So let us, uh, I pulled up a sheet of information that is not here, that is actually here. This is from World Nuclear Association. Um, so let's take a look at the, I believe there are six different varieties of generation four nuclear reactors that are in their table and they have a big table right here. And have they gone to seven now? It looks like there are actually seven when the last time I checked this, there were only six, but now there are seven. So the important things about these different reactor designs, and we'll go into some of the detail about the safety, like how they're, how the safety is gonna be different, especially with the thorium reactors, because that's something that I actually know a little bit more about than some of these others. But uh, so some things to keep in mind when we're talking about these different reactor designs, let me make it more bigger. -er. Uh, all right, so we need to look at the neutron spectrum. So if it's a thermal spectrum, then that means that there's gonna be a moderator in there that is specifically designed to slow the neutrons down so that they can be more readily absorbed by the fuel. If it's a fast spectrum, then that means that you just, that you don't need a moderator. It doesn't mean that you won't necessarily use a moderator, but you don't need it. It uses the neutrons as they come out of the reaction and there's enough fuel around it that the absorption probability is fairly high. And so you absorb the fast neutrons without having to slow them down. So the advantage of a fast spectrum is that, uh, well, you don't need a moderator. Okay, the disadvantage of the fast spectrum is that the absorption cross-section, or I should say the fission cross-section, is lower. Uh, another advantage of the fast spectrum is that, well, well anyways, we'll, we'll keep going. All right, now the coolant. The coolant is, what is it in the reactor that removes heat? What kind of substance do you have that removes heat out of the reactor core? So you could have a reactor core that's made out of jelly, but if you pump water through the reactor core and take the heat out of the reactor core into your turbines through water, then it would be a water-cooled reactor. So that's different than the moderator, different than anything else. So the coolant is what do you circulate through the reactor to pull the heat out of the reactor and send it towards your turbine. Uh, the temperature, this operating temperature is important. The higher the operating temperature, the more efficient uh, the reactor will be. Uh, that's just the mechanical efficiency of the system. It's not the fuel efficiency, it's how much energy gets wasted uh, due to heat because you're operating at low temperature. You don't have a big um, amount of high temperature energy that you can, uh, where you can extract a lot of that thermal energy. Now, one of the things that came up in one of the comments, I posted this to YouTube, I post these videos to YouTube and to Rumble. Uh, one of the things that came up in the comment was that I mentioned before that the efficiency of these reactors is limited by, efficiency is limited by one minus T cold over T hot. And uh, so something to keep in mind, T hot is not necessary. I said that this is the operating temperature of the reactor. Uh, and then this is basically limited by outside. These are not quite true. The where this efficiency comes from is a specific cycle in thermodynamic engines. It's a cycle that no one ever uses because it's a pain in the neck to use. So instead they'll use some other cycle. This is what you get for a Carnot cycle, but the, the steam cycle is not a Carnot cycle. It's a, it uses, it maps out a different path in pressure, temperature space, and uh, pressure volume space. Nevertheless, this is the best that you can possibly do is the Carnot cycle. So it's a useful thing to keep in mind um, it, as you change the temperatures, the efficiency of all heat engines is going to go up if you can increase the temperature of the hot reservoir and or decrease the temperature of the cold reservoir where you're exhausting things. Uh, so the actual efficiency, uh, someone Yang Sunny mentioned, is, is indeed Q cold over Q hot 
which is the heat absorbed um, into the cold environment, that you exhaust to the cold environment, and this is the heat that you absorb into your system. For a Carnot cycle, the way that it's set up, that you put in the heat capacity stuff and you end up getting this temperature equation. But temperature is usually what you're given, and so that's a way that you can put a limit on what's the most efficient I can make something. And if I double this, if I double this temperature, can I increase, how much can I increase the overall efficiency? So this is a good first approximation to what your efficiency is for a given engine. Now, this is not necessarily the temperature of the reactor, and this is not necessarily the temperature of the outside. This is the temperature of the substance that is put into the turbine. Okay, and so if it comes in, you might lose a bunch of heat. So you have a power plant over here, you pipe a bunch of stuff over here, and it might lose heat to the environment before it actually gets to the turbine. So this is the temperature of the working substance, which is typically a gas or a steam or something like that, which is, which is a gas, uh, that goes into the turbine. And this is the temperature that gets exhausted out of the turbine. So this is not necessarily gonna be room temperature or even outdoor temperature. If you're exhausting something at 300 Celsius, or 400 Kelvin or something like that, then that's not particularly cold. So you want to extract as much energy as you can from your working substance, which means that you want the exhaust to come out cold. If the exhaust comes out from your engine or your turbine cold, then that indicates that you've removed all of the random thermal energy from it, from the system. Uh, the bounds are going to be outside temperature and the incoming temperature, but the actual thing that goes into the turbine that really matters is going to be what's the temperature of the gas when it enters the turbine, what's the temperature of the gas when it leaves the turbine. Okay, there's a question here. They should put it in Antarctica. They should only they can only put it in Antarctica. That That is a good point. If you put it in Antarctica, you somehow have to get the energy across the ocean to everybody. Uh, but if you put it in Antarctica, you have to, you still want to be able to get the temperature coming out, the exhaust temperature, to be comparable to the environmental temperature. Okay, what is the purpose of the one minus? Does it serve a statistical purpose? Uh, that's a good question. For this equation, this efficiency would actually be the difference in temperature. Okay, so this is how much energy drops from kinetic energy. Like the random thermal motion of things is given, the temperature characterizes the random thermal motion of the gas. So it's the change in temperature that you have, which is uh, that difference. So that tells you how much energy did you extract uh, from the random motions. And then in the denominator is where did you start from? So it's the percent difference from where you started. Here's the difference that I have and here's where I started and that gives me a percent difference and that's the efficiency. And then you just work through the algebra and you get the one minus T cold over T hot. So that's where that comes from. Okay, now what did I, I can't remember where I was going with this. Oh, but that tells us this operating temperature. So the reason the operating temperature is gonna be an important thing to look at is because the higher the operating temperature, the more efficient the engine will run or the energy production will be. So for example, if you were able to double the input temperature, now it has to be measured in Kelvin. This is measured in Celsius, so you need to add about 300. Is it, two, it's 270 something, right? So you have to add 300. Uh, to this to get the Kelvin temperature scale, and that's what you'd plug into that formula. Uh, when you're operating at high temperature, if you can double the input temperature, the operating temperature, then you can almost get a factor of two in efficiency. You know, that's what you're limited by, at least, is a factor of two improvement in the efficiency, which means, <coughs> excuse me, um, that for the same amount of nuclear fuel, you get twice as much electricity. Uh, pressure. Now, pressure is going to be an important thing because a low pressure environment means that you don't have to have the big containment building. A high, wow, I'm gonna, I hope I don't have the hiccups because that would cut this stream short fairly quickly. Um, thank you for that. Uh, it's 273.15 degrees because that is the location of the triple point of water. The operating at high pressure means that you do have to have a big containment building around it because if the high pressure thing goes, then you have to be able to capture the stuff that turns into a gas. So this pressure, it's the operating pressure of the reactor itself. And um, so there are additional safety things that need to be considered when you have a high pressure system compared to a low pressure system. The fuel, notice that it has a bunch of different fuel, but most of it is uranium. Uh, this one has floor, has, uh, well, that one's also fluorine. So uranium is the most common thing. Um, and some with uranium-235 or plutonium-239, 
some of these things can also be using thorium. It, it depends on what it is. So, and I'll be talking about, anyway, so it is what it is. Here's the fuel. Uh, there are a variety of things that are run with thorium, but for the most part, uranium reactors are the ones that are closest to be commercially available for a number of reasons. One, we've used uranium more in our reactors, so we have a lot more experience working with uranium. And two, you'll recall from the last lecture that thorium has this, I think it's protactinium. You have to go from thorium, let me quickly pull up the p-table. Uh, yeah, you go from thorium to protactinium, and there is a, an isotope of protactinium that you have to go through before you get to the uranium that you use as your fuel. So you go from thorium-232 to protactinium-233, then to uranium-233, and it's the uranium-233 that is your fuel. And so the protactinium has a long half-life, and so it's a kind of a pain in the neck to deal with because you have to figure something out. Where when you start with the uranium fuel, then you don't have to go through that phase. Even if you start with... Uh, my understanding is that when you do a uranium breeder reactor and you go from uranium to plutonium, that the intermediate neptunium phase it has a shorter half-life than what you get with the intermediate protactinium phase. Be advised that that is part of the thing that drives the designs. Okay, so here's the fuel. And then uh, what does this plus mean? The plus means some uranium-235, that might be to start it off with, and then plutonium-239, which is where you breed it, right? So this starts with uranium-238, and then you breed it to plutonium-239. So that's a breeder reactor. This is a breeder reactor. Lots of breeder reactors in here. Uh, High pressure means 7 to 15 megapascals. So that is going to be what? 700 atmospheres. 7? 700 atmospheres? Is that right? No. That is 70 atmospheres. So this is 70 to 150 atmospheres because one atmosphere is 0.1 megapascals. And so this is going up to, you multiply by 10, and that gets you to 70 to 150 atmospheres. So that's basically the pressure at the surface of Venus. Uh, the pressure at the surface of Venus is... I think we're talking about the equivalent pressure to roughly 300 feet below sea level at uh, 7 megapascals, something like that. Uh, how would you do that? It's 100 meters below sea level, because G is basically, here's how I got that number, in case you want to do the math yourself. The pressure in, go away, the pressure in uh, water is rho, so pressure squiggles rho, I think it's equal to, gh. g is basically 10, right, 10 meters per second squared, and this is basically 1, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, but, you know, anyways, and then height is measured in meters. And so if you're talking uh, atmospheric pressure is 0.1 megapascals, when you see something that is 10 megapascals, then the question is, what's the depth that you would have to go? Like, how do you map the atmospheres to how deep that implies? So the pressure is rho gh. Rho is 1,000. Okay, 1,000. G is 10. That's uh, 10,000. And h, so you have to go 100 meters. And that is one atmosphere. Okay, I agree with that, that when you go down 10 meters, you add an extra atmosphere. So you have to go down another 10 meters to get an additional atmosphere. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so if you want to go to 100 atmospheres, then you have to go down 1,000 meters. All right. 10 meters for one, you want to go to 100, that means you have to multiply 10 by 100, that gets you 1,000. 1,000 meters down is the pressure uh, that you get inside these reactors. Okay, finally, we got that, got that one figured out. High pressure here is at about uh, 100 atmospheres. Okay, so that's equivalent to being a kilometer underwater. So high pressure. The fuel we've already talked about, the fuel cycle. The fuel cycle, when it talks about open or closed fuel cycles, that is, uh, do they know how it, you go from mining the material all the way through the use and then to the storage of the material is whether the fuel cycle is closed or not. Okay, size. So this is the size in megawatt electric. So this tells you basically how big of a reactor do you get with these different designs. So a one gigawatt, that's this 1000 is a one gigawatt. So you can see that a lot of these things are basically in the one gigawatt range, a gigawatt, a gigawatt, a gigawatt, because that's the standard unit for producing electricity. Uh, and then I don't know what this double star is. What's the double star? Battery model with long cassette core life or replaceable module, reactor module, battery mode. So that is this one that's kind of the low megawatt power type thing. And then the use here, is important. Most of these are going to be electricity production. You can see lots of electricity in here. 
Some of them are going to be hydrogen production. So because hydrogen gas is useful for a variety of things, someone pointed out in the chat of, on one of the videos that I posted to YouTube or Rumble that the hydrogen can make metals brittle, uh, which I can understand. You know, hydrogen diffuses through all sorts of things. And so, uh, but if you could imagine using hydrogen directly. So for example, suppose that you wanted to make cement. You want to make cement, so you need to have a flame, a flame of some kind of burning material in order to heat the clinker up to, or in order to heat the stuff up to make the clinker. And you have to heat it up to really high temperatures, like 1500 Celsius. And so if you can produce hydrogen, you have your cement manufacturing plant right next to your nuclear power plant, then you could just siphon the heat or the hydrogen that you produce directly over there and burn it right away. And then you don't have to worry about um, you know, you might have to replace periodically the pipes that send you from one place to the other, but you don't have to worry about long-term storage of hydrogen. So there are ways to work around it. Um, all of these things are uh, good jobs for engineers to figure out. Okay, so the use, most of it is electricity, some of it's hydrogen production, um, and, and there we go. Okay, so let's take a look at the different types of reactors, and knowing what these things are that go into it, it'll give us some idea of what role they might play in this utopian future where energy is free. Okay, gas-cooled fast reactor. So what does this mean? So it's a fast reactor. It's cooled with helium. So it's cycling helium into the core and out of the core. And it's that helium that's going to be driving the turbine, the high temperature helium. So it's operating at 850 Celsius. Um, you have to have it at high pressure, right? 850 Celsius and you're already in a gas phase. So your coolant is already a gas. And so when it's coming out at 850 Celsius, it has to be under high pressure. Okay, if you had something, for example, here, these salts, notice these salts, these are going to be liquid coolant and liquid coolant is gonna have low pressure because it's gonna be coming out as a liquid, it's not in a gas phase, and so the temperature doesn't increase the volume the same way that it does. The volume for the liquids does increase, but it increases in like a part per million, as opposed to increasing significantly what, what you get with the gas. Um, notice that water here, uh, helium down here for the coolant, whenever there's a gas, helium or water, that you have to have high pressure. And very high pressure, I don't know what the difference is between a high pressure and very high pressure, but there it is. So all these salts are going to be in a low pressure environment. Although some can be mixed. I, I could imagine, it looks like this one's kind of a mixed, in, uh, where you might have, anyways, a, a loop that's high pressure and a loop that's low pressure. Okay, so gas cooled fast reactors, cooled with helium, high temperature, 850 Celsius is useful for a lot of things. Uh, it's high pressure, it uses, it's a breeder reactor. It, the fuel cycle is closed on site, which means that everything is done on site. You use the fuel and then you store the fuel at that location. You can get up to a gigawatt with this, with the designs that are being um, thought through at this point. And then you can produce electricity and hydrogen. Now, uh, this hydrogen production does not necessarily mean that you're only producing hydrogen gas. One of the things that hydrogen production can mean is it could be just a general term for industrial applications such as steam reforming. So for example, if you want to make fertilizer, then you can take the, you can produce hydrogen from the water and take nitrogen from the air and reform the steam to get ammonia. Uh, and ammonia is what goes into your fertilizer. And so the hydrogen production is basically, can you produce an environment where you get extra hydrogen that you can put into something else? And that might mean that you're taking the hydrogen directly out of the water. It might also mean, for example, that you're rearranging molecules in a carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen environment. And, you know, cracking long hydrocarbon chains to make them shorter or whatever the case may be. That's this gas cooled fast reactor. The higher the temperature, the more useful it can be for industrial applications. And as was also mentioned, the more efficient your uh, generator will be. Lead cooled fast reactor. So this one's gonna be cooled by lead. Lead is a fairly low temperature metal. I mean, it melts at a fairly low temperature. You can melt it in a campfire because everyone back in the day, back before lead was poisonous, uh, you would gather up all your bullets from Boy Scout camp and you'd put it in an aluminum can and you would melt it and get a puck of lead because everybody wants lead. Uh, anyway, so that was uh, good times. So you, it's a fast reactor uh, where you're using lead as the coolant. So you have, you're cycling lead through the system. It can operate at low temperatures. Um, I'm sorry, it can operate at low pressures as a consequence. Again, it's a breeder reactor. And then here's, it's a closed fuel cycle, meaning that they understand the whole supply chain, what's going to happen to the fuel after the fact. And it can be stored regionally, meaning that um, when you finish using it on one site, you might not necessarily store it on one site, but you don't have to transport it all the way across the country to Nevada, where we get to store your fuel for you. Okay, molten salt fast reactors. 
I guess it's kind of self-explanatory, except now it's a fluoride salt. Uh, so that means that you take your fuel and, or you have some kind of fluoride salt, which has a melting point in some range where you want it to be. And that that is what you're using to cool your system. Uh, in these case, because it's a fast reactor, you don't have to have a moderator, but you'll notice down here, the next one down is a molten salt reactor and advanced high temperature reactors that these use thermal neutrons. So when you have, so these two different molten salt reactors, the fast reactor is going to basically be a, a breeder reactor where you're taking uh, uranium fluoride salt is your fuel. So you have uranium fluoride in that's your fuel. So it's a uranium molten, like a liquid uranium uh, substance that's your fuel and you're breeding it into, well, because it's a fast reactor, but you may be breeding it into plutonium, though it's not listed here. Um, or you could have uranium-235 as your salt and so that you don't, you don't need to uh, breed it. But anyways, so there you go, closed fuel cycle and you can get up to a gigawatt. The difference here between these, uh, this fast reactor and the thermal reactor is going to be whether you have a moderator there or not. So in a fast reactor design, you're going to have your core like this, and you won't necessarily have to have a moderator inside of it. For a thermal neutron in a molten salt environment, the salt, like the substance around it, is going to be where your fuel is located, and your moderator is probably going to be something like graphite that you have a graphite structure and you tune the size of the graphite structure, the size of the pieces, so that when it gets hot, the graphite expands. And when it expands, it squeezes the, the fuel out of the environment and slows the reactor down. So you can kind of have a self a thermostat that's self-regulating. So if the temperature gets too high, the gaps between the, you know, so you have an array of things that are sticking down there that are made out of graphite. You have them sized and spaced such that if the temperature gets too high and these things expand, you reduce the amount of space in between them so that the fuel gets squeezed out. And when the fuel is squeezed out of the moderator, then the reactor slows down. And so when the reactor slows down, you're still extracting heat from it to generate electricity. And so then these things will contract as they cool and that opens up the space and allows the fuel to get back in there. And so now you have more active fuel. So it's a way of having, having the, the physics of the system itself help regulate what's going on inside the reactor core. So this is for a thermal uh, neutron molten salt reactor where you have the moderator embedded in the system. Notice that in this case, it's almost exactly the opposite of what you had with the light water reactors where the moderator was surrounding the fuel. So you have a liquid water here and the uh, fuel rods were embedded inside the liquid water. So it was the moderator that was on the perimeter and the fuel rods were in the middle of the core. Here you have the moderator that's in the core and the fuel that's surrounding the moderator, which is kind of interesting. Uh, unique twist on the, the design of these things. Okay, so you can see, again, there's like fast another sodium cooled fast reactor. There's someone online who was like griping about, oh, sodium is this, you know, that's what napalm is. And you know, that's just, uh, yeah, you know, big, big shocker. So sodium is an explosive metal when it's not controlled uh, appropriately. But, you know, just because you can say bomb in a sentence doesn't all of a sudden make something nefarious. Okay, so sodium cooled fast reactors, again, you notice it's a fast reactor, so you're gonna be using uranium-238. Uh, MOX is mixed oxide fuel, I think is what that stands for. Um, and I used to know what that meant and I don't anymore. Uh, low pressure, closed system, and you get up to a gigawatt. So a few things to consider, water, supercritical water-cooled reactors, um, very high pressures, and very high temperature gas reactors. This one gets up to the highest. These this one here and this one here get up to the highest temperature. 1000 Celsius is like 1300 Kelvin. So at 1300 Kelvin, there's all sorts of stuff you can do at 1300 Kelvin that is pretty interesting. Is it metal oxide? Yeah, so um, is it metal oxide or mixed oxide? Uh, let's take a look. Mixed oxide fuel. It's reprocessed plutonium and uranium. So this is generally, I think MOX fuel, is that what they're using to disassemble the uh, you have like a nuclear warhead and so you send it to a plant and they will take the plutonium that's in the nuclear warhead or the uranium that's in the nuclear warhead and they will mix it down into this mixed oxide fuel. I think, I wonder if that might be what's going on there. Okay, so back to these designs and then we will go into some detail. Uh, should I do it this time? Yeah, I'll do it this time. We'll do a thorium reactor this time um, so that you can see what it is and then I have to figure out what I'm going to do next time. So this is, again, World Nuclear Association. This is where they're describing these different things. And it goes into some detail with each of them um, about 
you know, what are some of the current challenges in the designs and so forth. So let's talk about uh, some of the advantages you have for a liquid thorium reactor. So it's a thorium reactor, molten salt reactor. And what are some examples of the safety features that go into these designs that are different from what you get with a light water reactor? Why is it that a thorium reactor is going to be safer overall uh, once it's up and running and ready? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a thorium reactor, right? It could be any kind of um, molten salt reactor. So that's the kind that we're gonna talk about. So when you have a molten salt reactor, you're going to have your reactor core up here. Uh, let's pretend that it's a moderated reactor. So we're using thermal neutrons. So we have the um, fuel that's going and flowing through these uh, carbon, presumably carbon um, things, carbon moderator. You're going to have a heat exchanger over here. You run this pipe through, it's going to siphon off the heat, and that's what you're going to do to drive your turbine. So I think this is the chemical symbol for turbine. It looks like a bow tie. Um, so here's your turbine. It's connected to a generator, and that's going to go off to the power supply, and then you exhaust the heat down here into some tower, that then you have to reduce it again. Um, you condense the steam back down into water that you can then uh, run. Here's your pump. You can run it back into the system and heat it up again. So this is your cycle. Your coolant is up here. Um, now this could be, you might run, uh, presumably at these temperatures, you wouldn't run water into the system and back out. My understanding is with a lot of the designs is that you have the molten salt here. Okay, so it's molten salt, but this is molten salt that's made with fluorine and say uranium or thorium. Okay, so it could be either one of these. And then you have a second salt here that is also molten. So that way you can operate everything at low pressures um, and you produce the steam right before it goes into the generator. So in this case, you have a molten salt that's in here that is just gonna be some kind of fluoride, fluoride salt or, uh, but it's some other whatever the ion is that attaches to the fluorine. Uh, so in this case, it's you can have a molten salt that is your fuel supply and a separate molten salt that does not have the radioactive material that actually goes into the reactor and comes back out. So you separate your reactor fuel from the fuel that um, ultimately is going to evaporate the steam and drive the turbine. So this is the kind of designs that I'm I'm most familiar with. So here is a comment real quickly. I'm not sure if I heard the news yet, but apparently China just bought a fourth generation high temperature gas reactor online like yesterday. Oh yeah, so uh, China is building, they're working a lot on uh, generation four nuclear reactors because they're like, we don't want to necessarily relive the 1980s and 70s. Um, who would in, in that environment? They know that they need to supply a lot more electricity. Their options are basically coal or um, nuclear because there are only so many rivers that you can dam um, in in China. And there are some fairly big catastrophes that have resulted from previous uh, hydropower things. And so, yeah, they are building a number of generation four. They're like, why don't, let's invest in developing the most promising technology so that we don't have to, uh, we don't have to replace what we're building in the near future. We can build for the long-term future. Okay, so they're looking at a variety of different reactor designs. Okay, so with this uh, molten salt reactor, one of the main safety systems that it has is, or like one of the questions you have to face is what do you do when the reactor turns off? If the electricity to the reactor turns off, what do you do? And so the way that these things are designed is you have your nuclear fuel up here, and then they have a drain in it, and the drain has a plug, and then it comes off and there's either going to be storage tanks so like here's a set of storage tanks or else there's going to be some uh, it might be just some big container that's more spread out underneath it okay so then uh, what's going to happen so the power turns off included here there's a little fan here's a little fan right here that blows cold air across this drain so the drain is this is completely filled with the uh, fuel and then here's a this drain plug, and that plug is the same fuel. So let's say that it's a thorium fluoride fuel. So this is now solid fuel salt. It's a solid fuel salt, and you have a fan that's blowing air across it to keep it cold. So when the electricity turns off, so the you know natural disaster happens, big earthquake or whatever, power to the power plant itself gets turned off, the fan stops turning, and so now this thorium uh, salt plug at the bottom of the drain 
is exposed to the temperature here and it has no way of cooling itself off. And so it's going to melt. And so it melts away. And then once it finishes melting, all of the fuel that's up here is going to drain and be settled down into this storage container down here. In the storage container, it has a couple things. In this case, it doesn't have a moderator anymore. And so it turns off the reaction because it, it, everything is too spread apart for the fast reaction to uh, be able to sustain the nuclear reaction. So the reactor just turns off. Eventually this will solidify and you would just dig it up and you know break it into pieces or whatever and, and do whatever you needed to do from it. If this was a fast breeder reactor, such that you didn't have the moderator up here, it would still drain out. And now you just have it in a bigger container so that the fuel gets more spread out. If the fuel gets long and thin, then most of the neutrons are going to escape through the surface, right? The neutrons are going to escape through the surface of whatever it is. So the less surface area you have, the more neutrons are going to be contained within the fuel and the more likely the reactor is going to continue, reaction is going to continue. But if you spread things out and you increase the surface area, then you're going to increase the number of neutrons that escape. And the more neutrons that escape, the less probable it is to sustain a nuclear chain reaction. And then you get fewer neutrons and then more of those escape. And so the reaction turns off. So all you need to do is basically change the shape of the fuel supply when you're in this configuration. So even if you had a fast reactor, uh, it would melt through this plug and you just spread it out. And now the reaction turns off. So it's an easy way to turn off the reactor. Now I saw an interview with someone where they were saying, I feel a little bit worried about the fact that it's just a single little fan that's keeping this thing going. And they missed the point. The, the person who was speaking about this uh, did not articulate it the way that I would have articulated it in, in explaining why it's safer. So the thing is, you know, someone looks at this and they're like, it's just this plug and that's your whole safety system. And the way to think about these generation four reactors compared to the generation three and generation two, especially the generation two reactors, the ones that we're most familiar with, is that the, with a generation two reactor, you have, suppose you have a, sol, uh, a, what do they call it? A solid pendulum, a rigid pendulum. Okay, here's the rigid pendulum. And meaning that you can hold it, you know, it's, it's got a rigid uh, thing here and the mass is at the top. Okay, with the um, reactors, the way that they're designed now, the generation two nuclear reactors, you have to have the safety system is maintaining this thing up here. So this is like the safe state is here and the operating state is what it is down here. So it's operating down like this. And when the power supply turns off, you have to put it up in this state up here and then you have to maintain it up there. You have to have systems that turn on and keep everything in within some tolerance in order to keep it up in the safe state. Okay. And this takes active control. It's active control to keep it up in the safe state. It, if you let it go, it will go into an unsafe state. So it's unsafe down here. Unsafe is spelled with an N. And it's safe up here. And so with the generation two reactors, in order to keep it in the safe state, you have to have safety systems turn on and maintain it in that position. If, you, if the safety systems go away, then it will go from a safe state to an unsafe state. Okay. With the generation four reactors, it's exactly the opposite. You have it up like this, and this is like the operating state. And down here is the safe state. So in order to keep it operating, you have to have these systems that are turned on and functioning. All the operating systems have to be going. And then if you remove the operating stuff, then it goes into the safe state. And so it's exactly the opposite of the way that the generation two reactors work. So the natural state for these generation four nuclear reactors is to be safe when they're not operating. When they're not operating, they're in a safe state. Where with the generation two, when they're not operating, you have to keep them in a safe state. So what you do is you t start with the generation four reactors, you start from a safe state, safe, um, on, you don't have to mess with it. Like you don't have to invade its privacy or anything like that. You start in a safe state. You have to put it into the operating state. You have to pull the fuel out of the ground or out of this container, um, fill up the thing, turn, put the plug there, uh, blow the cold air across it in order to maintain it in the operating configuration. And then you operate in, um, in a state, a situation like the conditions where you're operating 
are the precarious conditions in terms of what is the where does the system want to go? The system wants to go into this equilibrium where it's all safe. So you pull it out of the safe state into the operating state. You run, and then if something happens to your um, control systems, then it goes back to the safe state. And so that's one of the main differences between generation three and generation four, especially the regular generation three and the generation two, the earlier generations in generation four, is what does the safe state look like? And does it go there naturally? So for the case of the thorium reactors, the molten salt thorium reactors, you have it in here. Maybe you have a moderator. You have this uh, salt loop out here that will then eventually evaporate some steam and drive your turbine. And then you have this safety system where if power is cut to your uh, power is cut to your power plant, this turns off, that melts, and it drains into this safe configuration. So that's uh, that's what these molten salt thorium reactors um, have at their disposal. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a molten salt thorium reactor, right? It could be a molten salt uranium reactor. It could be a mixed reactor where you have both uranium and thorium in there at the same time. There are a number of different designs just on the molten salt side where they're like, well, if we mix it with lithium, we get this property. And if we have a fast reactor, we get this property. Or I want to have a reactor where we just put in, we have a really neutron rich environment. So we have a lot of neutrons bouncing around and then I can put in anything that I want. It could be plutonium, um, it could be plutonium 238, plutonium 239, uh, plutonium is just PU. Uh, it could be plutonium 239, it could be americium. And so I could take spent nuclear waste, recall from the nuclear waste episode that about 1% of the nuclear waste is gonna be the actinides, which is uh, the actinides are these elements down here, past uranium, typically past uranium, protactinium counts as an actinide as well. But the, these elements down here, those go into the high level nuclear waste. These are the ones that we have to worry about. These are the ones with the long lived half lives that are the ones that we have to deal with long term storage. But if you just say, oh, I'm developing a bunch of americium that I don't want to store, so I'll just put it back in this environment, in this neutron rich environment, and then eventually it will break apart. There's some probability of it going through a fission. Um, there's some fission event happening. So anything that I build up because it just absorbs the neutron and doesn't break apart, I just keep it in there until it does break apart. Eventually you're going to get to this big gigantic floppy thing. Um, you know, you're going to get to Lorentzium or something like that. And it's just going to be too big of a nucleus and it's going to break apart one way or the other. And so uh, that's another advantage of some types of the designs is they're just like, well, we'll, we'll take all the waste from everything else and spend uh, or and uh, decommission nuclear warheads and we'll throw it in here and the neutron rich environment will just get fission from whatever happens. Um, some of them are a bit more controlled where you have to have the purity of the substance has to be such that um, the reaction can sustain itself. Another advantage you get from the thorium uh, from the molten salt reactors is because your fuel is now liquid instead of a solid you can reprocess it in real time. So I mentioned this before that with most nuclear fuels the way that it is now it's in a solid pellet and so you have this pellet that is uranium whatever and over time, the individual uranium atoms are breaking apart into other atoms or they're converting into actinides or heavier things. And so you have all the waste that's still embedded in these solid pellets. And that makes it difficult to process because you can't, it's hard to separate out the stuff that um, is no longer uranium from the stuff that remains uranium, especially when you're only talking about a few percent, like 2% of the material that you would be able to extract from this. On the other hand, if you have a liquid, then you can process that in real time. A liquid it already has the individual atoms are no longer in some matrix, they're in some fluid, and you can separate them out using you know, different chemical means to you take your, uh, your reactor fuel, you run it through a loop, and in here you have some kind of chemical processing, maybe it's a series of processing stations to remove you know, whatever it happens to be that you're worried about. So maybe one removes iodine and one removes strontium and one removes, um, you know, um, americium. And you just pull this out. And or as the fuel comes in, you can separate out in real time all of the waste products. And so that takes your waste from being the size of the pellet to being the size of 1% of the pellet because you're removing the waste and you're putting the fuel back into the system. So that kind of real-time fuel recycling 
dramatically increases the efficiency with which you can use your fuel. So instead of taking something that is 100 percent you know, fuel that you could use in a fast reactor, so that's going to be the uranium-238 um, and the uranium-235. So instead of having 100% uranium and using 3% of it or 2% of it and then storing the remaining 97%, you start with 100% uranium and you pull this stuff out and you end up using, you know, say 95% total of the fuel. So you have 3% that maybe you don't get to use because it's just been in there too long. I mean, it's, it's not like it's going to get old. It's already billions of years old. But for some reason, maybe there's some inefficiency in how you can use the fuel. But instead of using only 3%, you're using 95% or 97% of the fuel, and you're just pulling out the waste. And so that way, with a given amount of nuclear fuel, you get 50 times the amount of electricity. And if you're operating at higher temperature, then you get an additional 50% in the efficiency in the electricity production side. And so you get 100 times the amount of energy from the same amount of fuel if you can um, do this processing in real time in this manner and if you're operating at high enough temperatures in order to extract that additional energy. So there we go. That is uh, generation four reactors. Some of the main byproducts that you get or main advantage you get with the generation four nuclear reactors. The thing is that there aren't really that, there aren't any that as far as I know that are currently online in the commercial space. And so there are still a number of growing pains that are gonna have to happen when you build these reactors. What are some of the things that fail? How do they fail? How much does it cost to maintain them? Um, if you go out 20 years, 15, 20, 30 years. And so some of those things haven't yet been figured into the cost. And those are some of the things that you build a small reactor, you operate it, you see what breaks, you um, make repairs, and then that influences the design of the real prime time commercial gigawatt power plants. So start with the low end, make some mistakes. And when I say make mistakes, it's not like, you know, watch the power plants blow up. It's make mistakes like, oh, we probably shouldn't use this kind of welding at this joint on this um, portion of the reactor. We need to use a different kind of metal in our weld. And, or we need to make sure that we have, the alloy needs to be slightly different in this pipe because otherwise it's gonna corrode when this comes through. So all of these kinds of things go into reactor design that you don't necessarily know upfront until you've operated something for long enough to be able to see them long enough and at high enough power. So. Over the next, over the course of the next decade, these things will start coming online more and more. And then, you know, 20 years from now, we could have a whole fleet of these things that are uh, anticipated to live, you know, for a century. You could operate the power plant for a century um, with proper maintenance. So, if we were to build a nuclear reactor today, the best ones to build would be the Generation Three Plus nuclear reactors, uh, because those ones have already gone through this. Um, you know, they've already gone through a half a century of development and improvement in the designs. Um, where Generation 4, uh, it's very promising on the horizon. It's not necessarily the one you would build tomorrow, but it's the one that you would study today so that in a few years you can start building them commercially um, and uh, as we learn how they would be incorporated into the grid. One thing to keep in mind whenever you're working with any kind of new technology that goes onto the grid, um, even new technology that's been around for a while, uh, if it hasn't gone up to scale and contributed a significant portion of the electricity supply that we demand or the energy supply in general that we demand, there's going to be growing pains that go with everything. So if you're going to make a bunch of, you're going to make a bunch of solar panels and we've never made this many solar panels before, we don't yet know how that's going to affect the marketplace of the materials that go into the, uh, we don't know how it's going to affect the waste stream. Like what do we do with things when they start falling apart? Um, or if there's hailstorms that come through, how frequently are hailstorms going to come through? If you've only been operating a solar plant for, say, 10 or 15 years, you don't know what the 50 year, what's going to happen in 50 years that's going to cause your solar panels to break apart, if the, any solar panels that are originally there. So there's going to be, there's growing pains with anything, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, in terms of mature technology, nuclear energy, certainly coal has the longest uh, maturation lifetime. Um, hydroelectric power has a huge, um, you know, that's got a century of development behind it. Nuclear energy has 70 years of development behind it. And so some of these other things are still fairly young technologies and there's, there's going to be disasters, there's going to be waste problems, there's going to be all sorts of things that come up um, that are going to need to be addressed in, you know, as they come up. So that's the way, that's just the way that things work. All right, here's a question. Can a nuclear plant be upgraded? Um, okay, it depends on what you mean by the plant. So. If you have a generation two design, it's basically a generation two design forever because the core the, the core is the expensive part. And so you don't want to redesign the core 
um, you might as well just trash the whole thing and start over. Uh, but there are certain things that you can uh, improve, like certain safety systems. Um, so small things around the perimeter you can improve uh, as you do the maintenance. You can replace you know, whatever material with a different kind of material as you go, but you're not gonna change the, the fundamental design of the core. Uh, you can use, you could, for example, have you know, you have your generator and you just replace your core with a completely different core and the rest of the infrastructure could in principle remain the same. It might be so expensive that it's easier just to build new infrastructure, but if you have, you know, the turbine itself is going to be running off of steam, it doesn't matter where the energy comes from in terms of what the fuel use is. So if you have a generator that costs, I don't know, $15 million, you could imagine uh, a generator turbine set that costs $15 million, you could imagine just keeping that turbine there and replacing where you get your energy from when you decommission one core and replace it with a different one. So that's something that can that you could do. Okay, so here is an, a few more questions. Let me do, do a few more questions. Uh, let's see. Basically, thorium can burn, some version four can burn uh, nuclear waste, that's true. Uh, also modularity, oh yeah, so in terms of these uh, thorium reactors, many, most of the generation four thorium molten salt reactors that I've seen are ones that are specifically designed to be uh, small and modular as well. And so um, next time I'll talk about some of the applications of small modular reactors um, when, we, when we go there. But one of the things I mentioned was the idea of you have many different, many smaller reactors and so you can mass produce things and stuff like that. So a lot of the generation four reactors are designed, especially the molten salt ones are designed with that in mind. And so not only do you get the, the change in the design of the reactor itself, but you also get the small modular aspect of it. Okay, a few more questions for today. Do, do I have a paper where I can read them? I don't have a paper where you can read about these things. I would just recommend going to this uh, generation four nuclear reactor. Um, and there are some, uh, there's a guy with a YouTube channel, Gordon McDowell, I think is his name. He attended a number of conferences about nuclear reactor design, generation four design, and he has um, a bunch of videos of people speaking on these different kinds of things. Okay, let's see. If you had to choose between fusion and fission, which do you think we should invest in for combating climate change? Right now, uh, definitely fission. Fission, in my opinion, is the way to go for climate change because by the time fusion gets online and commercially viable, um, you know, most of the climate change issues are, will have had to have been addressed. Will have had to been, will have had to be addressed. So the time scale for fusion is long compared to the time scale for climate change, in my opinion. So I would definitely do fission. Um, so uh, fusion is, I think, my estimate is that fusion is uh, about 80 to 100 years from now before it's the main portion of our economy, if it ever gets there. But um, I'm thinking it's going to be quite a ways. Uh, let's see. Is all this info public or am I concerned about wacko terrorists use it for evil deeds? Um, any terrorist, all, all this information is public. Um, terrorists that are going to build a bomb, they're going to go to North Korea or whatever. Um, so there, there's no real concern about, you know, how do you, I mean, all the plants, making a nuclear bomb is fairly easy, it's just expensive. And that's the thing that limits them from doing it. So, so I, I'm not worried about any of this getting into anybody's hands. Because this is all stuff that, you know, there are smart people who are in terrorist organizations, they, they can figure this out. They don't need um, video to, or a, a Twitch channel to, to get this information. Uh, is fusion scale ever going to be commercial viable? I do think it, that fusion will eventually be commercially viable, but uh, not yet. Let's see. Do I think humanity will be able to use fission energy as its only energy source? That's a great question. I'll have to save that one for next time. Do I think it can use it as its only energy source? The answer is probably no. Do I think that you, it can use it as the bulk of the energy source? I think the answer is yes. So I think that with fission energy, I could easily imagine getting up to two-thirds two-thirds of our energy use coming from that, with the remaining third coming from a mixture of other things. Um, maybe you could get up to 80%, uh, but there's always gonna be some stuff that, where it just, um, you know, some kind of liquid fuel makes more sense. So I think there's airplanes, I just see liquid fuels as being the, the, 
the fuel source for airplanes for a long time. So anyway, so I think um, if we could get to from right now, it's 20% of electricity production, which is nuclear. And if that I could easily see getting up to, well, what, what could you reasonably get to with nuclear for electricity? Kind of, you'd have to, this, I guess this is a subject for another time, but um, for electricity production, 80% to is probably where you could go to. And then when you're talking about replacing indus industrial heat and when you're talking about replacing transportation and things like that, you know, so if you electric, if you increase the electricity supply so that electric vehicles, um, you know, you can have electric vehicles, then, you know, then that could replace almost a third of the economy, depending on, you know, the types of electric vehicles that you have. So there, there's a bunch of, once it, once the electricity becomes, uh, there's more of it, then you can start, and it comes in with uh, higher energy density, so like higher energy content, then you can start using that energy for other things that are currently being supplied by fossil fuels. So it's, uh, anyways, there's a lot, of, there's a long way to go. Um, but I think two thirds is probably fairly reasonable, uh, especially with the high temperature stuff and up to 80% in the future. But right now that's like total energy budget across the globe in all sectors. If you're talking about just electricity, then it can go higher. Okay, let's see. No fossil fuel is needed, just fission and electricity to hydrogen. Uh, that might be true. I don't know what airplanes look like yet um, with that. I don't think there is a nuclear plant for every car. Uh, you don't need a nuclear plant for every car, right? It's a gigawatt. Um, you have a gigawatt nuclear plant. Uh, you charge things at night when the demand is low otherwise. Um, could the will for nuclear energy development survive another accident? Uh, I think so, because... So it depends on what drove the accident, right? If it's an accident that is driven by the largest, um, the largest earthquake in recorded history, then you know I think it can survive it. If it's an accident that's caused by stupidity on the part of uh, some uh, top-down, and it, there's a number of things that can go into what causes an accident. I think that people are doing the math. Um, more people are doing the math themselves and kind of seeing the consequences of. Uh, ill-informed policies. So honestly, I wonder if nuclear accidents were more common. Um, I'm, I'm not advocating for this, but the problem when you only have an accident once every 20 to 30 years, then, you know, what well, we have three accidents in 60 years. So we, you have one accident every 20 years, then it's a big news item. It's like, oh my gosh, there was a nuclear reaction and a nuclear accident and it caused all these problems. And there were really hardly any problems at all um, that weren't especially hardly any problems that were caused by the reactor core itself. Um, if they were as common as natural gas or coal um, accidents, the challenge we have today is that they're so rare that the because of the rarity, they get blown up out of proportion to what actually happens in those situations. So I'm not advocating that there should be more accidents. Um, what I am saying is that the natural... Um, Hold on a second, my computer's about to die. The uh, challenge, the issue right now is that, or one of the issues is public perception. And the perception is that these things are very common. And as a consequence, they get overblown. If disasters, not disasters, but if accidents were more common and reported more frequently, it would be like another car accident. Like nobody talks about car accidents. So anyways, there's that. How do we deal with peak valley energy with nuclear? Online, offline, keep them quickly enough. That's a great question, Mystic Fear. Um, how do you deal with peak and valley and the energy use of, of nuclear? How do you deal with the fact that it um, you don't always have the demand for the supply? And so that's something where having industrial capacity to be able to siphon off nuclear heat, um, you can reduce the heat. Um, maybe you can have multiple turbines coming off of something, and you um, you drop the control rods in and lower the temperature and therefore you I don't, so some of those things I don't know in general you would have all the baseline power su supplied like the everything that's demanded at the lowest point you could supply that with nuclear and then just deal with the peaks with something else um, so that's a great question um, I agree that you could imagine doing electricity to hydrogen and then or nuclear energy directly to hydrogen and so forth um, it's the same for so storage uh, is storage the answer for um, nuclear as it is with wind and solar? So in the case with some of these things, 
Um, so in the case of some of the nuclear designs where you have the molten salt already, so you have a nuclear reactor, here's your nuclear reactor. And so this is something that you could do with solar. Um, it's harder to do with wind. It's less efficient to do it with wind. So here's your reactor. And you could have a vat down here of your coolant salt. So here's your salt that's molten. And you're cycling this through like this. And here's your thing where you're boiling the water and you drive your turbine. So here's your turbine and your generator. And you just, um, when you're operating through the day, you heat up the molten salt. Um, I'm sorry, when you're operating at night, you heat up the molten salt, and then during the day when the demand ramps up, then you extract energy directly from this vat of salt down here. So it's a thermal battery. So that's, a mad, I could imagine something like that, um, where you already kind of have the thing there. It's just a matter of increasing the volume of your tank, and you um, use that as a thermal battery. So that's something you could imagine building in. I'm sure engineers have even better ideas than I do.